Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. I'm Jim Ramos, and I'm here with our producer, co-host, and my brother from another mother, Dale Culver. How you doing, my man? I'm doing great, Jim. Hey, good. I'm excited about today's guest. This guy has the number one podcast that reaches both Catholics and Protestants. So pretty cool. Uh, it's called the Broken Catholic Podcast, and uh, really have had a great time. I was on his show last week. I'm really excited to get this guy on. And uh, but before we do so, what is your man word for today? Well, it's, in it's all, Catholic. No, it's in all his stuff. <laughs> uh, broken? No, it's just that. It's, uh, just he, give it to he me. He could me. probably guess it, but uh, the man word that I came up with, and most people might not think this is a manly word, but surrender. Surrender. Oh, Good job. Yeah. Wave the white flag. Why? Yeah. Why? Explain that word. Well, I think if you have too much pride to surrender your will, uh, then you're going to be messed up. And so when you can get to that point in life, you go, man, I, I just can't do this on my own. I need some help here. Mm -hmm. um, or you've been going the wrong direction for a long time and you just got to surrender that will and say, okay, uh, I need to turn around. And so I need to surrender my will and get some help with that. Yeah, man. I think um, at the end of the day, pride takes men out. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it may manifest in lust or alcohol or whatever, but it's pride that takes a man out. His inability, his unwillingness to seek help. And, uh, right. you know, in Isaiah 14, Satan had five, I think, I will statements and that he got booted. And so this this I will stuff is lack of surrender. And, uh, you know, we can't become our best version unless we're willing to surrender to the God who created us. But we're going to talk about that more on the show. Yeah. And so I'm excited about that. Do you have a shout out for us? Yeah, it looks like his name is Acme Inc. A-K-M-E. As long as it's not Acme. Inc. Yeah. Yeah, he had a pretty great, uh, we've got some great reviews. So thank you guys for doing that. But uh, one of the things that stuck out with me, he, he went on a hike with a bunch of guys and he took the man card book with him. And he used it to do some teaching with the dudes as he was on this hike. Uh, to encourage them and, and all that good stuff. So, hey, thank you so much. Email me at info at and I want to send you some swag. So, yeah. And that's you. cool. Acme, he must be a Roadrunner fan. Yeah. There, you know that? Remember that? I, I think Does somebody understand what I'm talking about? I think he's a okay. tattoo artist. I'm pretty sure he's a Roadrunner fan. So, <laughs> so for you, Acme. Me, me. <laughs> hey, I'm excited to have our new friend on here today, Joseph Warren. Joseph is... 43 years old, lives in Tampa, Florida. He's newly married to his beautiful wife, Fallon, and they have a baby on the way due mar in March. So excited to have that. And congratulations. And Joseph is a spiritual coach to Christian business owners and CEOs who are living in the stress bubble of life. He helps them grow in their business without stealing time from God, their spouse, or their kids. Man, that's just exactly what we're, that's just, we're all about that. Joseph is also the host of the Broken Catholic Podcast. His show is listened in over 50 countries around the world, and to date, he's had over 100,000 downloads. In today's episode, we're going to learn how the pursuit of society's definition of success and happiness led to a moment of surrender and conversion in Joseph's life. Joseph is also the author of The Broken Christian, which is the topic of today's show, among other things. Joseph, it's great to have, on, have you on the show, brother. Gentlemen, good to be here. I love the word of the day, surrender. And you're right, surrender. it's it's the top thing that we wrestle with as men, but it's a taboo word. We don't like to use it because it sounds like weak. Think about battle and warfare, like whoever surrenders, that's the loser. And nobody wants to show up as a loser in their life. But mm -hmm. in the spiritual realm, surrender is the very thing God is waiting for us to do, I believe. And that's well, what's blocking us in our lives. Mm -hmm. it, you know, Christianity is so dichotomous in nature, right? You have to be weak to be strong. You have to surrender to win the battle of life. You have to uh, give in to get. You have to let go. I mean, it, over and over and over and over again, we see this, this dichotomous, this paradoxical outlook on Christianity. And I just love it. I just love it. But hey, speaking of that, I'm going to throw you right in to our rapid fire round. Are you ready for this? I guess I am. It sounds backwards to me, but let's let's go. Oh, we're it's backwoods. Is that how you said backwards or backwoods? <laughs> backwards. Because, <laughs> buddy, it's both. We it's are both. backwards. Hey, I've taken uh, key <laughs> phrases. Yeah, yeah, we are both. Uh, key phrases from your book and from uh, some of the stuff you sent us. And I just want to 
throw the phrase out and I want you to explain what that phrase means to you. Okay. You got it. All right, buddy. Here we go. Young and invincible. Young and invincible. I think uh, as men, we all go through that stage of life, uh, normally in our teens and early 20s, sometimes later in our 20s. And if you're like me, uh, well into your 30s. Um, and it, it's just this self-reliance, reliance on myself rather than others and ra rather than on God. And I relied on my power most of my life. And that's where I ended up miserable and empty. Oh, yeah. The problem with the self-made man is he worships his creator. So that's uh, super good, man. Appreciate that. Okay. Number two, struggles into stories. I love this in your book. Yeah, I believe, uh, you know, most of us are searching for our purpose or, you know, what am I meant to do? Why am I here? And I think uh, many times we resist looking back into the past, into the pain and, and really pulling from that and saying, okay, what, why did I go through that? Why did God allow that in my life? Even though I created it, right? I created the pain, the mess ups and everything like that, but I was allowed to experience it. How can I, rather than ignore it and forget it ever happened, like it's some distant memory or I don't even remember who that person was, it, it's not me and who I am now, is really go back and pull from that and say, okay, I went through that struggle for a reason. And the reason is the struggle that I went through, other people are experiencing right here, right now, today. I can help them, if not just move them one step closer. Or, or help them show, show them the way out of, the, of that struggle. But if we just forget about it and, and just act like, ah, I don't want to remember that anymore, um, then what's the point of having gone through it? Yeah, that's good, man. On page 61 of your book, you wrote, I believe that God turns our struggles into stories that heal, our pain into power that conquers, and our trials into triumphs that last. I love that. In other words, God turns our mess into our message. And I think that's so good, man. And I love how you addressed that just now, that we can't avoid that. Uh, we can't shrink back from that. We can't be embarrassed from that. We've just got to embrace it and, and seek the healing that in order to turn that mess into a message, that struggle into a story. So uh, thanks. I really appreciate that, man. Thank you. You got it. Can I build on that one? build away, man. It's your show. Yeah. Listen, I want to build on that because I, I think when we forget what God brought us through, we are now not giving him the glory. And if we're not talking about it, if we're keeping it private, cause we're ashamed, like, man, I did some messed up stuff when I was younger. And so we don't want to share that with people because what would they think of me now? then we're actually doing kind of back to your, what you said, self-worship. We're not glorifying God that he brought us through that storm and telling everyone who is in front of us, hey, look what God did in my life. And then inspiring them and saying, listen, God wants to do the same in yours. What are you struggling with right now? Yeah. No, that's so good. You know, I think of Romans 8, 28, 8, for God works all things for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so many times I see guys sharing their past in a bra bra braggadocious kind of way. Oh, I was a womanizer. I was this. I'm like, no, 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 no. The things that I celebrated in my youth, I'm ashamed of now. And I try to find victory over. And yes, God put me on display, not to boast about my past, but to turn my mess into a message. And that's just uh, so good, but we have to be humble to do it. The, the, you know, it's the pride that gets in the way of surrender, right? It 100% does. Anytime we take credit for anything good in our life, um, we're stealing from God. Yeah, that's so good. The only thing hey. I take credit for now is all the wreckage. <laughs> like, I, I have a trail of human wreckage behind me, and that's not yeah. something I'm proud of, but it did happen. I used a lot of people. And yeah, I was surviving. I was, I was just trying to make it in life and nobody really taught me any differently. Um, but now going forward, it, it's really, how do I spend the rest of my life glorifying God with whatever skills and abilities he's given me? And this is something men wrestle with. Yeah, no, I agree so much. So, which goes to my next one. And you talk about in your book, targeting your inner darkness. Can you explain that? Sure. Um, I think uh, the reason why many of us or most of us um, end up at the end of our life taking our last breath 
with a stack and laundry list of regrets is because we haven't targeted the inner darkness. We haven't gone within and done the inner work. And Mm -hmm. I believe God wants us to do the inner work. Most of us are very exterior focused. So we Mm -hmm. look at, we look very horizontal uh, rather than vertical. And God wants us to look vertical. And here's what happens when you look vertical. When you look up to God, God shows you a mirror of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all avoiding. We don't want to see what that looks like, right? Because if God shows us what we look like and what we've done, then we have to go in and fix stuff. But here's the lie of the enemy. The lie of the enemy is that you and I have to go in and do the work. Mm-hmm. And we don't. It's we have to surrender and get out of the way, but address it, face it and say, okay, Lord, I messed up. I, I don't know what to do about this. I have addiction in my life. I have a divorce. I, I, I've you know, hurt these people. I don't know how to fix that. I need your power, your strength to heal this mess because I don't have a clue what to do next. And when you get to that place where you just surrender and move out of the way, and as C.S. Lewis says, become a little Jesus, meaning allow Jesus to enter in. He does all the cleaning. He does all the healing. He does all the restoring. That's the, the fact of it. That's the truth is that you don't have to rely on your power, but you do have to be willing to go in and look at the mess, look at the darkness. Because if you don't, it still has power over you. Anything that's still in private still has power over you. So if your listeners wrestling with addiction right now, for example, you know, most many Christian guys are wrestling with porn addiction. Many of Mm. my spiritual coaching clients, they're super uber successful guys in business, but they're cheating on their wives through porn. And, and they can't stop. They don't know how to get past it. And it really, when they keep it private, um, again, it has power over them. So I really work with them in just making it public. And, and when you make something public, you allow God's light in. Mm-hmm. And when God's light in, healing happens. That's the mm-hmm. next progression of it. And it loses its power over you. You get your power back. You get your power back. Is that in line with uh, your next phrase, the surrender principle. Can you explain that? Uh, Yes, it is, right? So it's exactly that. So uh, the surrender principle is something I coined just by doing my spiritual coaching with my clients. And I believe this, uh, the number one reason why we feel stuck, why we feel tired, why we're frustrated in one or more areas of our life is because we're holding on to something rather than giving it to God, surrendering it up to God. So we're playing God in that area of our life. And that's the problem. God wants you out of the way so he can heal, he can restore. Uh, So it could be specifically like uh, you're holding on to hurts from the past uh, that you haven't surrendered. You haven't gone in and, and done the forgiveness. Or you're worried about your future. You're worried about your business. You're worried about providing for the family rather than realizing that God runs all the money on planet Earth and it doesn't even belong to any of us, right? Or you're struggling in your marriage. Uh, you know, I mentioned porn addiction as an example, but maybe it's just not willing to let your wife in to the other parts of your life, like your business and the finances. I know some guys, when I start working with them, they've been uh, keeping the finances is a secret from their wife and some of their spending habits. And the problem is they haven't surrendered it yet to God. And here's what happens. If you don't surrender it up to God, it's going to eat away at you. And eventually it destroys your life. It destroys everything that you've ever worked for. So the worry and the stress starts to build up and it causes you to act out in your Mm -hmm. life. Right. And the acting out, you know, can look like costly addictions, Uh, It can look like uh, poor judgment, poor decision-making, right? And it can look like harmful habits, things that hurt you, that hurt your spouse, and that hurt your kids. So the solution is simply to stop trying to control things outside of your control. And and you have to give up. You have to finally surrender to the the only one who can um, help you through these things, that can heal you through these things. That's so powerful. And we've never actually addressed surrender on this podcast directly. We've never had a full frontal attack and, and uh, it's woven throughout our podcast, but I really appreciate you just attacking that phrase. It does sound like weakness, but for a man to fully walk in his best version over time, he needs to be free to do that 
And he can only find that freedom through surrender. That's right. When he moves his ego out of the way and becomes a little Jesus, then I love that. Yeah. his life starts to work out really, really well. You said move his ego out of the way. I remember uh, years ago, I had somebody tell me ego, E-G-O, edging God out. And you just said, yes. move him out of the way. And there's something to that, right? I'm getting him out of there. So, hey, I, I got a question for you. I'm curious. You could have named your podcast anything. You went with broken Catholic. Mm. And, and to me, that's striking and it pulls me in because I'm like, what the heck is this guy all about? Who is this guy trying to reach? But you, indeed, you're not trying to reach Catholics, nor are you trying to reach Protestants. You're trying to reach all of them. Can you explain the title and, and why you landed on broken Catholic free podcast? Well, it came to me uh, when I was doing, um, you know, inner work. I was at a place in my life where I was surrendering. Uh, an hour a day to God um, for eight months, right? Every single day, spending an hour in just silence and learning the the spiritual discipline of guided listening prayer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than talking. And uh, in that time, you know, God revealed to me my identity, uh, my purpose, right? What I'm meant to do with my life. And um, part of that looked like outside of the holy hour, right? When you start to spend time with God in your life, he starts to put the right people into your life. He mm -hmm. He's moving uh, in your life now because you've let him in, right? With your time. That's the, that's the key to everything. So I was... Um, at a podcasting conference and I had no interest in doing a podcast, but my friend was the organizer of it. And uh, I said, Hey, why don't you just come? And so I'm sitting there at lunch at, with uh, this top podcaster uh, and a whole group of aspiring podcasters. And he went around the table and what's your show about? What are you looking to do, et cetera. And he got to me and I was the only guy at the table with no show. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't. Like, I have no interest in podcasting. And so he, he started digging in. He's like, well, tell me about yourself. And so I, I kind of shared a little bit of background. And in my story, my personal story, there was some testimony that just kind of surfaces when you've done the inner work. It just shows up. And now people are interested and want to know more. And as he dug into it, he goes, man, so you're, you were raised Catholic and then you left and became an atheist and, and then God somehow pulled you back and, and now you're on fire, like out speaking about God in your life. Like, dude, you should do a show called Broken Catholic and, oh, like, man. and talk. And here's what's the funniest part, how God works, Jim. The guy was a self-proclaimed deist, right? He wasn't Christian or anything. And he's telling me to do a, a, a show called Broken Catholic. And he said, but take it differently and talk about all the brokenness that you've experienced and don't try to look good. Like, and be, he's like, here's the problem we all have us non-Christians have with Catholics and Christians is you're all so self-righteous. Mm. You're all positioning yourself like you're better than us. And it's sickening. And then you're a bunch of hypocrites because you all struggle with the same crap as us. And man, I, I kind of, I was like, whoa, you just got my attention. And he said, so do a show where you like, you bring people on other Christians and, and Catholics and you, and you talk about like their mess, talk about their struggles. Like that'd be a show that I would listen to. And then he asked the rest of the table, would anybody else listen to it? And one guy puts his hand up. I'm an atheist. I'd listen to that. Another guy goes, I'm agnostic. I'd listen to that. And all of a sudden I realized God was present in this table of all these non-Christians. And God is, is speaking to me through these people saying, don't just do a Christian show, but do a, you know, a very Christian show with a polarizing name that splits people down the middle. And, and that's what it is. And it's awesome because a lot of my guests that come on are Protestant, but they go, Joseph, I'm a broken Catholic. Like I, I was raised Catholic, but now I'm a recovering Catholic, you know, and they joke around and all that stuff. And listen, God's going to meet you wherever you are. And I believe we're all broken Catholics in some form or another. No, that's really good, man. You said you talk, You said they encouraged you to talk about your mess. And um, you said, uh, talk about your personal story. So speaking about your personal story, why don't you take a couple minutes here and tell us more about your personal story? Because I know your story, you've kind of danced around a little bit, but I know your story involves making and losing millions and, and uh, a father wound and all these things. Why don't you walk us through it? Yeah, you got it. Uh, so 
I'll go back to, I was raised in a, a very strict Catholic home uh, by a Marine Corps father. Uh, and he came out of the war and he, he just wanted to do his best, right? He wanted to perform well as a soldier. And I think many dads, they, that's mm. what they, they go for. However, um, what he did or the mistake he made was he overcompensated. And uh, he brought Marine Corps training and Catholicism together. That's what I call redundant. Um, and it was our childhood was uh, a lot of rules and regulation and be a little soldier and boys don't cry and don't show emotion and and God is someone to be feared and and you know really I grew up with this image of God as tyrant mm. and it's really difficult to love a tyrant. Mm -hmm. um, so at eight and a half years old, my parents went through a very uh, messy divorce and the custody battle lasted for two years and. Uh, it was extremely painful and, you know, I have good parents and they loved me. Um, but when it came to personal agendas and trying to win over the kids, you know, the enemy entered in our home. And um, I remember, uh, you know, having whispered in my ear over and over and over again, your father never loved you. It was all a lie. Mm -hmm. He's been pretending your whole childhood. And as you know, Jim, you know, when you hear a, a lie enough times, it becomes mm -hmm. your truth. And that's exactly what happened to me. And eight and a half years old, I couldn't process that. And I just felt betrayal. And yeah. I felt it yeah. on both ends of, of the table. I felt it, well, if this is true, then dad betrayed me, betrayed me. And, and I can't trust anyone. And if this isn't true, then mom just betrayed me because who the F would say that to her son? For sure. And it was just this painful place. And I remember at that early age, I made an unconscious decision never to love again, never to wow. let anyone in because I never wanted to feel that again. <laughs> and I closed off my heart to everyone. And then fast forward at age 19, I, I said, I want my life to be different. I grew up in poverty and all this stuff. And I, I, I just said, I'm done with God. I'm done with family. Um, and I want three things. I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. And I want to be wealthy. And I went out on a mad pursuit of those three things. And I became to, I started to worship those as my gods. And I got them. First year, we, you know, started a professional fundraising company for national nonprofits, and we did two, over $2 million in revenue in 12 months. And we were like, what That's the heck awesome. did we just build? And, uh, well, you know, we, we figured out what we did right. Um, we built a system around it, and then we scaled into multiple cities, and we did $2 million in every city. And um, eventually, you know, after 110 hours a week of work um, and building up this company, I burnt out. And uh, I did a early semi-retirement at the ripe old age of 24. And um, I partied. I partied hard. <laughs> and I, I became an expert. I was an expert in business. And now I was an expert at, at foolishness and, and partying it away. And I went into some very dark places in my life. And I did things I'm not proud of. And I hurt a lot of people. Um, and... I was almost murdered twice and God spared me both times, even though I wanted nothing to do with him. And, uh, but I look back on those two moments when I was spared and I, I know I shouldn't have walked out of both of those situations. Mm. And I know God was the one responsible for that. And I say it now on, you know, when people ask me, I said, listen, I was, uh, the one sheep out of the 99 that was out in the mm -hmm. darkness and God left the 99, it came to meet me where I'm at in the darkness. And he, he carried me home. And, you know, that's the message for anyone listening right now is that if that voice in your head says you've done, you know, really bad things, there's no saving you. God would never forgive you. Um, that's a lie. It's such a lie. You're the exact one God wants most. Mm-hmm. You're the lost sheep. That's why he speaks about it. So that's a little bit about my journey. I'll go deeper wherever you want to go. Yeah, man, that's really good. Uh, I, I, and I appreciate you not glorifying your sins. So many guys that get up there and they want to 
everybody wants to tell the same story. I womanized a bunch of women. I was this big stud and now I'm this wimpy Christian. And I'm like, well, I don't, I think womanizing is not, you know, I just appreciate the fact that you didn't glorify that because it's not something to be proud of hurting another person. Um, and so, but hey, on page 60 of your book, you wrote this about, and then the, I'm going to couple this with your story that you just shared. You are not defined by what happened to you in your past. You can choose your future. You can't change your past, but you can choose your present. And your present is what defines your future. That's a very rich statement. I love that. So going back to your past and looking at your present and future now, Joseph, what specific calling has God put on your life today? And, and as you work with and coach men, do you have a, a baseline or a definition that you work with to help these guys understand what real manhood is? Mm, that's, that's a loaded question. Um, let's break that down in three parts. What's the first part you want? So let's do this. Let's talk about this specific calling that God has put on your life. Yes. So, From your past to your present. Yeah, for sure. Um, when I was spending an hour a day um, just in silence, listening to God for eight months, you know, every day consecutively, um, God was healing all my father wounds um, and really just restoring who I was. And, and the way he did that was by he first had to build up my identity because I put my identity in my income and in my uh, own talents and abilities at that point. And after I lost it all, I was a very broken man and I had no clue who I was because I put my identity in the wrong things. And I think many sure. men, that's where they're at. And, uh, so I remember, you know, uh, as I'm journaling and I would, I would just hear not audibly, but here in my heart in the quiet whisper, you know, God would address me as my son, my precious child. Mm. And, and it, over and over every day, the same a greeting. And, and I, eventually I got tired of it. And I was like, God, why do you keep saying these wussy female terms to me? Like I'm a freaking man, like my precious son, my child and all this stuff. And what I realized in that moment was that he was filling in all the wounds of, of my childhood um, mm -hmm. that, you know, being raised with military, you know, and, and a lot of that father uh, relationship was not there. And all that I had done was I had projected my human father relationship onto God, the father. And I oh, saw him sure. as, as this tyrant of judgment, wrath, and condemnation rather than compassion, love, and forgiveness. So he was filling in all that. And that was the first step. And so in that identity, um, months later, he shared with me what the mission or calling on my life is. And I heard simply this, bring my sons back to me. Mm. And I said, what about your daughters? I remember it was like yeah. just a reflex. And he said, my daughters will soon follow. Yeah. And I remembered I had no clue what that looked like. Bring my sons back to me. Which sons? How do I do it? Where do I find them? And um, it was over time uh, that he slowly has revealed this to me. And what he's revealed to me is um, the way I would bring his sons back to him is by teaching them and showing them what he showed me which is how to uh, spend an hour a day in silence listening to God um, because that's what he wants. He wants every one of his sons and daughters in front of him in conversation, in intimacy, and not so much talking at him and saying, God, please bless me and bless this person. And oh, by the way, so-and-so has cancer and constantly asking God for things, but how to just shut the bleep up and listen because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we have to say to God. All that matters is what he has to say to us, about us, about our identity, about why he created us, what he wants from us. So learning uh, now, I call it the daily holy hour. And I start men off with a 40-day holy hour challenge. And I challenge them to spend an hour a day in silence. And I teach them the actual spiritual discipline I was taught by my Baptist brothers. And that was the game changer for my life. So my purpose now is to make this daily holy hour worldwide. No, I, I love that. In fact, that is uh, on my schedule every day from eight to nine is prayer. And I take the Lord's prayer and I go through it. I usually don't get to the end and I spend about three quarters of the time in silence. And every good idea I've ever had has come through that. And so 
you know, we talk about Christianity being a relationship with God. And I understand there is a point where, uh, you know, I have a three and a half year daughter and it's why Papa, why, why Papa, Papa, can I have a candy? Papa, 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 Papa. And as she matures, she'll be comfortable just sitting with me and just in silence. And so what has been my go-to all these last 30 years of ministry has been silence before God in the presence of prayer, letting him speak to me. But when you ask most Christians, what is prayer? They'll say this, talking to God. And that's not true. That's just partially true. So I, I appreciate that. I affirm that. And man, I'll tell you what, I think you just changed my boots on the ground action item for today. So um, I'll roll with that. But did you, in the process of, you know, bringing your sons back to the father, and to me, when you say your daughters, his, when God said my daughters will soon follow, I get that because we believe here that when a man gets it, everyone wins. Everyone wins. Thanks for saying that 10 feet from the mic, Dale. Anyway, uh, everyone wins. And so, so for a man to get it, that is a game changer. But, but you have to also start with a foundation of what we're trying these, to get these guys to or where we're trying to lead them. So what, is, what have you come up with as a definition for a real man? I believe a real man is someone who is, is a man who is fully surrendered to God's will and God's timing in his own life. And when he's able to do that, he becomes a spiritual reservoir that overflows into his spouse, into his children, and into everyone around him. So it's as St. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but it's God who lives within me. That's where a real man's power comes from. That's what masculinity truly looks like is when you let God pour through you and fight your battles. You just show up and get the F out of the way with your ego. And, and, and to become a real man, you have to go through a crucifixion. But it's not the crucifixion you think. Yeah. Most of us think when Jesus says you have to die to yourself, we think it's like this, this visible or physical death. It's actually not. I believe it is you have to be willing to allow and watch your ego be crucified. Mm. It's your ego that needs to be hung on the cross beside Jesus. That's what Jesus is waiting for. That's the surrender principle is learning that your ego is the very thing stopping you in all areas of your life from getting you what you want. Once you put it on the cross, surrender it up to God, all control, it's crucified. And then three days later, you rise up a new creation. That's true masculinity. And that is the ultimate bravery to let go of one's ego, one's pride, how you started out the show, because that's the very thing we rely on most is self. My life first is John, I'm sorry, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. This life I live in the flesh, I live for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. We just had Rick Johnson on our show. He wrote a book called The Power of a Man. And in his book, he takes a whole chapter called Defining Manhood, and he defined it almost exactly as you did. It's when a man gives up himself and begins to serve others. You know, in Israel, we have the Dead Sea. Everything flows into it. The Jordan River flows into it, but nothing flows out of it, and it's dead. There's nothing there. You're saying you're a reservoir, so you've got an opening. You've got a floodgate that's, that's pouring out on people because of the overflow in your heart. And so you, you went right back to surrender. Everything's going back to surrender, right? Uh, in your book, you quote Max Dupree, who I love his book, uh, The Art of Our Leadership is an Art. And he said, we cannot become what we want by remaining what we are. So when you uh, coach these guys, what is the most common struggle that you see among men who are your coaching as your clients? They're trying to control everything in their lives and they think it's mm. all up to them. And they're really putting on themselves undue, unnecessary pressure and pain and struggle. And we're, we belong to the God of the universe and he's our father and he loves us and he wants to remove this pain and struggle again the only thing stopping him from removing the pain or giving you the blessings you've been asking him for in prayer day after day, year after year is your ego. That's what's blocking him. You're the one blocking God from blessing your life. 
dumbass. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, somebody needed to hear that out there. I'm like, come on, you dumbass. Realize this. So, so when you said, right, we said spiritual reservoir. Here's the problem a lot of guys do. Uh, they're, they become saved, right? They, they lead these dark lives and then all of a sudden God calls to them and they're this lost sheep and then they get saved and they're powered up with the Holy Spirit, right? A lot of my Protestant brothers especially. And the first thing they want to do is go out and, and save others. And they think somehow it's up to them. And they think that it's within their power to do so. And do you know what they forget to do, Jim? What? The very thing they forget to do is to be built up and poured into by God. See, it's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to become a child of God and, and to know what that actually looks like to live in the Father's house. If you think back to the Bible and the prodigal son, I, I love this question uh, someone brought to me was, hey, Joseph, after the prodigal son returned home from his foolish lifestyle and ways and he asked for repentance, God forgave him, yes, and welcomed him back. They had the feast. Everyone drank and got and partied and were happy. What was it like for the prodigal son the next day, the next morning? What did he do then? Because it's, it's one thing to be forgiven and restored. It's another thing to learn how to live in the father's house again. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, that can sometimes take a long time. It doesn't have to, but for me, it took a total of over 500 hours of sitting silently with mm. my creator and him teaching me how to live in his presence, how to move my ego out of the way, how to surrender on a daily basis. After I got poured into, then I can be a, a, a spiritual reservoir for others. But so many of us, what we do is we make the mistake of we get a little, we get a drip from God and we're like, oh, yes, finally it quenched my thirst. Let me go serve others. And we're serving them from what they, they call a, uh, we become a supply pipe mm-hmm. for God rather than a, a reservoir. And we're not filled up. If you think of a supply pipe, it constantly has nothing left for itself. Mm -hmm. It's always Mm -hmm. empty after God pours through it, right? And most of us are that supply pipe. And we don't leave enough for ourselves. And that's why we're not showing up as spiritual leaders for our spouses and our children. But we're out evangelizing everyone else. Mm -hmm. We need to stop. We need to be the spiritual reservoir. And it's wife. It's God first, wife second or spouse second, kids a third, then everyone else. And most of us don't get the hierarchy of God. Yeah, you have a chapter in your book called I Am Third. And I was driving to church there, and I felt like God spoke to me and said, the priorities of life are this. Jesus needs to be the most important person in the universe. Your wife needs to be the most important person on the planet. And your kids need to be the most important people of your generation. And so, hey, we're going to take a short break, come back, after we hear from our sponsors. You want to fix that real quick? Hold on, Joe. I got my, I got tangled down here. <laughs> Can you do it on your own? It got wrapped around, dude. <laughs> oh, no, it didn't. It's right here. He rolled his chair over his microphone or headset cord. That's why I was doing a little left lean. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first person to have done that. I've done that, my friend, many times. <laughs> Welcome to your humanity. Oh, buddy. Anyway, so, okay. Hey, we're good. All right, we're back here. And, uh, you know, when you were sharing that earlier, Joseph, it, I realized this, that, you know, we live in a country where we can have anything we want now. We are event driven, right? I want it. I got it. I've got the event. I celebrate the event. But, but really, our faith is a process. Relationship is a process. And so you said earlier, quote, we belong to the God of the universe. And then I go back to your book, man, on page 133, you wrote something very powerful. You said, your life is a puzzle that only God understands. Now, I'm going to read that again. That's very powerful. Your life is a puzzle that only God understands. Without him, your future will be locked away from you. You will continue through life trying to figure out on your own spinning in circles. You know, we talk about men becoming their best version. In your book, you talked about men becoming their best version, even out of their brokenness. But it seems like this is, maybe I'm oversimplifying, Joseph, but let me know if I am. It seems like if a man can just look up to the stars and 
realize that he's been made by a loving creator who knows more about him than anyone else, who loves him more than anyone else, and in simplicity, by faith, if he surrenders to the God of the universe, eventually God will take him to his best version. Am I oversimplifying things? No, I think uh, you're just restating uh, what Jesus said, is that when you put uh, seek first the kingdom of, of God and all these things will be given to you. Mm. This, this is the answer. Is, is that oversimplifying? Maybe, but that's yeah. how Jesus said it. And, and that's the answer to everything. But we're all out chasing the wrong things. And we're, we're putting everything ahead of God. I did it myself, right? But when we're able to put him first um, and, and putting him first, you know, isn't just uh, talking about him to others and trying to evangelize, but yeah. it's with your time. They say, uh, you've heard it said before many times, you can tell a person's priorities by looking at their credit card statement. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. But yeah. I say like this to my clients, I can tell uh, your priorities, your spiritual priorities by looking at your calendar. Yeah. And that's one of the things I work with my clients on. We create a spiritual life calendar. And it looks like putting God first, putting your spouse second, and putting your kids third. And un unless you're willing to do that and put in the time with God, see, all God wants is time. You, you yeah. said it earlier, Jim, right? Relationship is spending time with another. That's all it is. And you, you mentioned your daughter. And that's such a beautiful example is that she's, you, you're seeing the, the growth in her as, as a child, right? She's going, Daddy, why, 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 Daddy? Why did this happen? Why is that going to happen? I don't understand. Why, why, why? And now she's becoming this young adult mm -hmm. uh, who's content just sitting in your presence, and this is the spiritual maturity that God wants from each of us. Right now, most of us, the way we pray is we go, God, why did this happen? Why, how did, why did you allow that? Why is this person sick with cancer? Why, why don't my finances, how come they're not working out? Why is my wife nagging me? Why? Right? And we do just like your daughter was doing. Because why? We're spiritually immature. And God wants to bring us to a higher version of ourself, which is uh, he wants us in sonship. Right, speaking to your male audience or daughtership yeah. to your female audience. And, and, and he wants us in presence. That's the intimacy. That's where all the gifts, all the blessings he has for you are waiting if you go and spend time with him. And people say, Joseph, why does it have to be an hour? Can I do 10 minutes? Can I do 15 minutes? And I said, listen, you can. I've had clients do it. It's kind of the wuss version. Weak but, sauce. Right? But what I have seen is the clients that do the 10 minute version and they slowly ramp into giving God an hour are the clients that get the least blessings in their life. Mm -hmm. The clients that say that make the decision definitively, you know what, Joseph, I'm done sh doing this all on my own. I'm done with controlling my life. It hasn't worked out great for me. Sure. I made some money, but man, I'm miserable. Or, or, you know, I, I just have all this emptiness. I don't feel fulfilled. What's next for me. I want to know. Those people that get definitive and say, you know what? I'm going to do an hour a day with God for 40 days. And as you know, 40 is a biblical number. It's the number of testing. Why does it work with the holy hour? Because God wants to know that you're there for relationship with him rather than to get something. So you got to show up an hour a day. And here's, there's some science behind it too, which is pretty awesome with the daily holy hour. And that is, it takes the human mind about 50 to 55 minutes to quiet down and shut down the noise of our highly distracted world. Isn't that fascinating? Which means you're only going to get about five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes in intimacy with God. Yeah. That's where you have the breakthrough. And you mentioned it earlier, Jim, the best ideas and breakthroughs and solutions in your life have come from that quiet, intimate time with God. He wants that for each and every one of us. Well, in the last three months, God has asked me two questions during the prayer time. And I'm still trying to answer them. Instead of him just giving me an answer, he said to me about six months ago, I don't know, I can't keep track anymore, but so, Jim, why do you want to speak? I travel around and speak, and I've got people now. I just got an email from a guy in Africa. Why do you want to do that? 
So I gave all the so I gave all got all my excuses and then realized I had to repent before God who knows the answers. The other question he asked was, I want you to what are you doing to reach the men of your community? Mm. And so these are things I'm pondering, but all these great ideas, these great thoughts did not come out of me, they come out of that time. So I would really recommend that to guys. The other thing I've noticed, Joseph, is when I was a young man, young in my faith, I'm like, I used to think, train me in how to share my faith. And so I had this desire to win people over, win them through an argument of my faith. And, mm. I, and I would do that. But now as an older man who I believe has grown spiritually over the last 30 years, I just want to share the most important thing in my life with people constantly. And, and Jesus comes up in conversation naturally now without, without coaching, without um, fishing for people to bite. But it's just a natural overflow. It's not some pipe pouring out. It's an overflow. And I think that's when a man realizes, hey, I'm, I'm getting there in my journey because Jesus is so saturating my life. It's just an overflow. So that's um, and powerful, powerful stuff, man. I, I just pray that our guys get this. You know, page 132, you write this about being a Christian. Being a Christian is about interacting with people in a very real and human way. Thus, you know, your podcast. It's not about running away from opportunities that present themselves. It's about no longer behaving bipolar. If you're a Christian, be a Christian at all times, regardless of who is watching you. And I think this is a big issue, Joseph. I want to ask you about this. You know, I think of uh, men were very compartmentalized. I think of uh, guys like professional athletes can be at the top of their game uh, and over here and be a train wreck over here or movie stars, or even I, I think of Navy SEALs who are the greatest warriors on the planet, but, but, but are divorcing at a rate of 95% during wartime and 90% during peacetime. So this, this, this extreme compartmentalization of men. How do you help men work through compartmentalization on their way to surrender uh, when you're coaching these guys? That's a powerful question. I think it, it's all about showing up whole and complete. Mm. And most of us don't, right? To your point, we leave God at the door of our businesses. Uh, we become, as I said in the book, bipolar Christians. Mm -hmm. And we feel it's taboo to speak about God boldly in the workplace, not mm -hmm. realizing that the workplace is the ministry. If you're running a business and you're a Christian, then it's all about marketplace ministry and it's bringing God into the work workplace. And it doesn't have to look polarizing. It doesn't have to be repelling. It doesn't have to be preaching you know, and Bible belting people, but it's rather inviting people into conversation. Something I just had a business acquired a few months back. And one of the things we used to do was we used to greet our walk-in clients, uh, which is say, how are you today? Right. And, and they would respond, great. How are you? And I would say, I'm blessed. And <laughs> that simple little uh, acknowledgement of saying, hey, it's not me, it's God, or uh, something bigger than me is, is pouring into me, um, would open up conversations. And most people, when they hear I'm blessed, they go, oh, I love that. That's such a beautiful response. And they open the door to a conversation, or as they would leave our establishment, we would say, have a blessed day. And so many times, I can't tell you how many times people would turn and, and go, are you a Christian? <laughs> and I say, of course. And they go, me too. And you just saw them take a sigh of relief. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we can talk about this. And before we know it, we're having a conversation about God. And, it, and it's just very inviting. Um, it doesn't have to be repelling. A buddy of mine, that billionaire I mentioned, um, he, he prays in the boardroom uh, with his entire staff before any, making any big decisions. And he surrenders it up to God. Now, most of his staff, he admits, are atheists and agnostics. And I'm like, dude, what's that like for them? He goes, I don't care. It's my business. I run it the way I run it. And I am very upfront that God runs this business. He's the CEO. I'm not. So if you want to work here, this is what it looks like. Now, you don't have to pray. You don't have to participate. But it's going to be happening all around you. So you decide if you're fine with that. 
right? And, and he's created this culture of surrender within his entire business. And what has God done with that? Well, he just keeps pouring financial blessings into this guy's life where this individual gives away almost 90% of his, of his revenue, of his income, wow. right, to charities and everything. He feeds 100,000, you know, families and meals and stuff here in Tampa every single year. And it's like, yet he still lives in the multi-million dollar homes. He's got the, all the fancy cars and stuff with the 10% left over. Yeah, for sure. God keeps pouring into him because he's a good steward, because he's acknowledging God in all things. And he's moving out of the way. And by the way, he spends an hour a day every morning in silence, listening to God lead his business. That's why his life is working so well. Well, we've addressed a lot of stuff here, Joseph, about surrender and putting God first. And uh, we're coming to the close of this podcast, but there's one thing that we haven't addressed that I think we really need to as we help these guys step into their best version. And as you coach these men, um, you just said earlier, it's about showing up whole and complete. So I want to talk about those many, many out there. You said that you are one of them. I am one of them. I think we are all one of them who have been broken by another person. Who are, who are broken because somebody has broken them. Um, on page 104 of your book, you said this, quote, forgiveness is the key that will set you free, whether it's others who need to forgive you or people you need forgiveness from. In both situations, you must forgive yourself first, then ask them for forgiveness, then forgive them. Accept that you're not alone in your brokenness. Every person on this planet is broken. Just let go and release the anger and blame like I did. When the blaming stops, the healing begins. And, and that is a powerful quote from your book and very, very difficult for people to accept. And what I've learned in ministry for 30 years, Christians are really not the best at forgiving. We should be. We're probably I the see- worst. We, we struggle with forgiveness, and I don't understand why. Can you walk us through for this process of forgiveness and why we have to forgive to truly surrender to God? I think, and, and I'll make a bold statement again, I think Christians can be some of the worst at forgiving, and that's why we occur and show up as hypocrites uh, to non-Christians. Um, so I, I believe that's in play because we don't actually feel worthy of God's forgiveness. We don't believe that God can forgive us for all the bad we've done in our life. So not only do we block God's forgiveness in our own lives, but then we also refuse to forgive others who hurt us. And it's just this trickle down effect. And you're right. um, It's one of the most difficult things to do. That's why I do spiritual coaching because a man's not meant to go through it alone. He needs that spiritual coach. Um, I have something called the four spiritual anchors. And who are those people in your life that you need in order to have the accountability to create the life that you want? And one of them is a spiritual coach, someone to call you out on your mess and for you to have skin yeah. in the game with it. Because if there's no skin in the game, you're not actually going to do the, the work. And some of the work looks like, going back to forgiveness, um, I give them you know, forgiveness phone calls to make. And, and that's confronting. Um, but when I explain it and why it's necessary and why it's the thing that's holding you back from getting the thing you want, you know what? Men show up courageous, dude. And, and yeah. I've never had a client not do those calls. They do the forgiveness calls and they restore the relationships. But there's three parts to forgiveness. And most of us have done one or two, but we're missing the third. And that's why we're still in chains from our past mm. hurts and wounds. So the, the, the three people that are involved in forgiveness, and you know this, but let me just say it anyway, for someone who's listening, who maybe doesn't, um, when, when for forgiveness and healing to truly happen, you must ask for forgiveness from God, right? And that, that should be first, right? God will forgive you if you come with a repentant heart, okay? That's the first thing. Then many of us um, forget to ask forgiveness for from ourselves, mm. right? And 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 that holds us back. Or some of us will give ourselves forgiveness. Okay, God forgave me. I forgive myself. But then we won't go and ask the person for forgiveness. 
See, that's the three. You got to get forgiveness from God. You got to get forgiveness from yourself. And you got to get forgiveness from the person you wronged. All three must happen for healing to really happen. It's just the way God set it up so that you're not stuck within yourself and your ego and your pride again. Right? It's a very outward type of giving uh, experience. And it's the same thing in receiving forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because many of us, I believe, are great at giving love to others, but we suck at receiving love. We suck at receiving forgiveness. And sometimes a person will look you in the eye and you say, dude, I'm really sorry. I messed up on that one. And they go, dude, I totally forgive you. Yeah, but I'm such a loser, man. I, I don't get why I do that. What the bleep, right? And we just beat ourselves down and we don't forgive ourselves, even though they forgave us. God's mm -hmm. forgiven us. And we're holding it back from ourselves. This is why if you're doing that, you're missing one of those three. So when you're able to go back and do all three and you just clean up the messes in your life one after another, dude, everyone that you have a conversation with, you get lighter, you get freer. And now you're starting from this solid foundation where you can build a life that you want upon. Yeah, you know, I think of Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus teaches, teaches us about forgiveness. But I think it's interesting. He says, forgive us, forgive us our sins as, as we, we forgive others. So there's a, there's a triune nature to this, right? God, me, and others. Yes. And to piggyback on that, as we forgive others is another way of saying it in equal proportion to. So if you're holding back forgiveness from someone in your life, you're not giving them forgiveness because they hurt you so deeply, yet you're going to God and, and asking God for forgiveness. Sorry, that's not how it works. God says, forgive them and I'll forgive you in the equal measure. See, this is, we miss these little things, but these little things are very big things in our life and they hold us back in all areas. Well, you know, I think of Luke, uh, when I, I talk to people, I, I deal with people all the time who are in bondage. They're, they're owned by somebody who hurt them. And the person that hurt them is the last person on the planet they want to own them. So they're caught in this vicious cycle of bondage. And I take them to Luke 6, 27 to 37. I say, look, at, here's what Jesus tells you. Pray for that person. They go, oh, I'm not praying. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. God knows your bitterness and the stench in your heart. So pray about that person. Be honest. Start praying, God, I hate this person. Crush them. Strike them. I hate them. They've hurt me. Be honest with God. I used to say the F word a lot about a certain person to God because I was so effing pissed at this guy. But then I continued to be committed to the praying for this person. And then as you pray, your, your cursings will turn to, well, God, strike them, get them, do something to hurt them, so turn to you. And then slowly, as you pray over time, you begin to pray blessings on that person. And when you can play, pray blessings on the person who's hurt you, that's when you know you have freedom and you have forgiveness. But it really is a process, and, and, and people need to realize that. It's not, you, you can't just say to somebody, I forgive you, uh, because oftentimes that's not authentic and real, and you stay in your brokenness, even though verbally you've expressed that you're free. And so I really appreciate that, Joseph. I think it's so powerful uh, for our guys. Uh, we might have some guys out there listening right now that go, man, I need a coach. I, I, need, some, I need some help. Uh, is, how can these guys get a hold of you if they're struggling and need somebody to coach them? Is there a way to do that? Yes. And before I give that, I just want to uh, piggyback on that. You know, a lot of guys will, be, you know, we don't want to get vulnerable, especially with other dudes, right? We have an image to protect. We got, we got, everybody's walking around with these masks, a mask of looking good or trying to avoid looking bad. So to admit that there's something broken, there's something off or something I don't have figured out in my life is it, it takes so much sometimes. And I, I, I look at it this way for anyone listening right now where you're like, ah, I'm not sure I want a coach or I need a coach. I'll just figure it out on my own. My question to you is, how's it working for you? <laughs> how's it going? If it's working, great. Keep doing it. If it's not working, I guess you probably want to change your approach, right? That's what it looks like. And, and to think that having a coach is weakness, you're, you couldn't be more further from the truth because Look at all the professional athletes you worship in your life. You remember all the stats of their life because you hold them on such, you know, thrones. And all of them, think about it. They have professional coaches at the highest levels of their game. Do you think when they started in high school, 
right? High school football or whatever. They, they saw the value of a coach, but then when they're in the NFL at the ultimate and they're in the Super Bowl, they're like, you know what? I don't need a coach anymore. Of course not. They realize they, they, the, a coach is a critical part. It's an anchor in their life to keep them performing at the highest level. So I want to say this to anyone listening. If you have a business coach, so you have a coach for your business, maybe you have a coach for your marriage, maybe you have a coach for another area of your life, why don't you have a coach for your spiritual life? If you're made of body, mind, and, so and spirit, why would you not uh, have a coach for the only one of the three that last eternally? Right? So that's what a spiritual coach can show up and do. Um, if any of uh, your guys are listening and they're like, you know what, Joseph hasn't pissed me off that much today. Um, he seems all right. He may know a thing or two about being broken and then finding out the way out. And maybe he can show me how to get out of whatever I'm in right now or whatever I'm struggling with. Um, then I'm going to invite anyone listening, uh, jump on a spiritual clarity call with me. Uh, it will be a video chat. We'll spend about 30 to 40 minutes speaking about two things, giving you clarity on what do you want in your life right now? What does that actually look like? Because most of you haven't even asked that question in a long time. And then the second part, um, after you get the clarity, that's my gift to you. You'll walk off that call with a breakthrough some, somewhere in your life. Uh, then we'll uh, chat and see if you want to work together. And if we want to work together, I'll tell you how. If not, no big deal. You still get the clarity. I don't charge for this. This is something I show up and I want to contribute in your life. Uh, if that's of interest, you could go to josephwarren.net uh, and just click uh, schedule clarity call, josephwarren.net. Yeah, and what people don't realize is, yeah, an athlete has their team coach. They also have their public publicity coach. They also have their financial coach. They have all these coaches that happen way, way beyond the athletic performance. And so, hey, I do want to say something. I was going to apologize to that guy I called a dumbass. And I realized I haven't done this before, but I think that that really is a person who needed to hear that. Uh, and so you've been choked, you've been sh shaken and awakened. And so um, I look forward to hearing from you about uh, your journey. I don't know why that phrase came out. I don't use it very often, but uh, for you out there, let us know how you're doing. So, hey guys. Uh, so what's next? Guys, what do we do? What action step do we take because of today? And I, I had one thing lined up, but I want to do something different. For one week, one week, I want you to carve out an hour out of your schedule for one week and sit in silent prayer. Bring a note. Don't bring your phone. Bring a piece of paper and a pencil and just spend there, spend that time, one week, an hour of prayer and silence, just focusing on God and letting him speak to you. Shut up. And listen, you've got two ears and one mouth, so twice as much listening than speaking. Hey, guys, we'll also post the Boots on the Ground action item on our weekly equipping blast that you can subscribe to at meninarena.org. And when you do, I'll give you a free electronic version of my 365-day bathroom book for men. So make sure you head on over to meninarena.org and get that taken care of. And, guys, hey, we are a nonprofit crowdfunded organization. We exist to help you become your best version because of a large group of generous donors like you. We're able to freely offer this podcast weekly equipping blasts and discussion forums to you, plus men in underdeveloped nations, missionaries, and our active military. So guys, until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor, hear the deafening roar of the crowd, taste the sweetness of victory, smell the stench of battle, get in the dame game, get dirty, carve out an hour, grind it out, and be a man.